Hi, it's camera guy. I sorry, I just saw somebody peeking out from the side, and I was like, oh, big ass fucking camera. He's supposed to be here. Let's just talk about material, right? Let's just do that. I thought this was supposed to be a show about grief and our in our darkest times, and uh, I planned the whole thing where I was going to talk about sad stuff, but then everybody was like, bum -da -boom -da -bop, I'm having a great time. And I was like, oh, fuck, great time show, huh? But I'm going to get into it because that's the thing that's right. <laughs> uh, my name is Omid. I'm an American. We look like this, too. Thank you. <laughs> My dad is Indian, and my mom is Iranian, so technically I'm Pakistani. Thank you. <laughs> I'm uh, not a scary brown. I'm uh, just a hairy one. <laughs> I fly a lot. I don't do anything scary when I go to the airport. But I do like to see how far I can walk away from my luggage. <laughs> My record right now, two terminals. <laughs> so we have uh, something in common. Uh, we are both part of the Dead Dads Club. I thought you were going to say we're both handsome. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we got something in common. Grief. Grief. <laughs> I'm actually a two-time member. I don't want to brag. but you have two dead dads? I have two dead dads. That's... Yeah, not a lot of people get two dead dads. No, I was very lucky and very unlucky. Yeah. <laughs> when you think about it, yeah. That pain, going through that pain twice, twice. is a lot. Yeah. Well, your dads were not gay. No. You had a dad and you had, had a stepdad. Yeah, I had a real... Everybody has a, a, a real dad somewhere. The guy who came. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then left. Went. The guy who came and the guy who <laughs> went. Yeah. And that guy's then, real. Yeah. That guy's a real OG. That guy's the real... That guy's the real deal. <laughs> that guy who just came and left all his responsibilities. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So my, my real father uh -huh. and I weren't that close. And then... Uh, Enter stepfather a few years later, and we were really close. What was your relationship with your with your stepdad? With my stepfather, <laughs> I loved him. <laughs> what a guy! My relationship with my dad was up and down, but when you think about it, pretty up. Like it yeah. was still missing a lot of things. Like I used to say that my dad was like this is when he was alive. I'd say my dad's like a wall. He supports you, he just won't talk to you. <laughs> like that's how I saw him he was just this figure who took care of everything but also never really wanted to talk about more than just like the top level stuff i mean he just was very on the surface about it i feel like that is a dad that's a very common dad uh, trait uh, i feel like a lot of people nine complain of about that nine yeah. out of ten dads i would say are like that i'm having a weird one today let me be honest with you um i lost my dad four years ago on this day at a supermarket, he went down one aisle. <laughs> I went down another aisle. After 20 minutes, couldn't find him. Never saw him again. <laughs> he actually uh, passed away at his house in India. And I was in the uh, Edinburgh Fringe Festival at the time. And uh, I got a phone call saying that he passed. And then I had to go to India immediately. I had to drop what I was doing, which was just a show, not a huge deal. And I had to go to India because that's a much bigger deal. And uh, he was there and he had passed away and uh, it was a heart attack. Uh, not a big deal. Super big deal, actually. I don't know why I just said that. <laughs> so they waited for me to get there. And, um, and since I was his son, I had to be the one who cremated him. And it's not like a Western one where you just pop somebody in a microwave and then they're done. This was... <laughs> I don't know if they got it out of Game of Thrones or if it was just trending at the time. Like, it was straight out of Game of Thrones. We had to set him up on a pyre, and then I had to walk around him with this piece of wood on fire. And then this guy was like, say some words before you light your dad on fire. <laughs> and I just decided to go with the first word I could think of, which at the time was Dracarys. And I'm... <laughs> I had to see him in India, like, they put you in this, like, cooler. 
no joke, like a glass cooler. So my dad's in this glass cooler in the living room, basically embalmed like in his mouth and stuff like that. And he's just laying there. And I see him, that's the first time I see him since he dropped me off at the airport so I could go to Edinburgh. Like, wow, that was it. And I saw him and I came down on my knees and I cried. I cried, I cried, I cried. I cried so much that I literally just walked about like 20 feet into our living room and just passed out on the other side. Like I hadn't slept in so long and I was able to sleep for like four or five hours. And then somebody woke me up and was like, have some tea. And I had some tea and then boom, like everyone's coming over. Ceremony is going to start like, let's open this box. Let's undress him. Let's wash him. Let's put him on a wooden board. Let's tie him to the wooden board. Let's put him in the fucking car that doesn't fit a body. Like all these stupid things were happening. But the thing that everybody uh, did was they'd all touch their heart. Anybody who saw my dad in the in the car with me holding him in knew that he had passed and in India it's like customary to just touch your heart so I had this view of while we were driving of just watching all these random Indian people touch their hearts and that was really a blessing like it was really yeah. beautiful to see that because it showed that you don't need to know somebody to understand that someone's in pain you can you can feel it you can feel somebody's pain pretty quickly just by seeing it it was a lot like that day uh, there was a lot there there was there was a ton my dad left me his clothing company. That's where I get all of my material from. <laughs> Four years ago today. <laughs> People were coming up to me at the funeral. People that he worked with being like, hey, did you know your dad owes me $30,000? I don't have a receipt, you just have to trust me. And I was like, well, just take it up with him, man. I don't know what to fucking tell you. <laughs> I was in Edinburgh six hours ago. I mean, people were asking me for money though at the funeral too. No. People were like, I'm so sorry about your dad, but we had some pockets that we were designing for his new pajamas. Do you want them to have Velcro or would you like a real button? I was like, I, I don't know why you're talking to me right now. I really have no clue why you're saying words to me right now. When my stepdad passed, I had uh, just started smoking weed that year, like the year before I mm -hmm. started smoking weed really late. And um, I, I'm at my, my stepfather's funeral and one of my high school buddies comes up. I'm having a moment with my mother in front of the casket. We're two feet away, you know, mm -hmm. and people come up and talk to you as they go by. And a buddy from my high school comes right up, right by the casket. And he's like, yo, you're smoking weed now? I'm like, oh, what, can we talk about this uh, later? And uh, like, <laughs> uh, like, he's like, some people just don't get it. Some people don't understand how to act. And maybe it's because it, ha it hasn't happened to them yet. Yeah. There's a silence that you find, I think, when a parent passes. There's like a there's like a level below zero of quietness. Like it's something even in the negative realm of where you're just like so fucking quiet and focused that the world doesn't have sound anymore. After I got rid of all the clothes and then I moved to England, I thought that's where I was going to start grieving. I thought, okay, I'm, I'm moving to England. I'm going to start doing stand up here. I have a one year work visa. That's where the grieving process will begin. Didn't happen. I was in a relationship. There was no grieving time. It, was, it wasn't right. I literally was working more than I've ever worked before. Right. Going out all the time, making a fuck ton of money and just having a great time. The only time I really did start grieving, March, 2020. As soon as the pandemic started and everything oh, shut everything down, slowed down, everything slowed down. There oh, was wow. nowhere to go. I was in my yeah. apartment. That's when I was like, oh, Fuck. this is it. This is my time to grieve. And I took it. I took it hard. Like I just kept, I just kept thinking about him. And I, I eventually, you know, you never get over it or anything like that. But right. I eventually just had enough time to talk to my mom and ask her a lot of questions about their relationship and how their life was, which was so important to me and just figure out where I wanted to go next and what I wanted to do. So yeah. it was really the pandemic that helped. Basically, I came back to LA, had a store in the fashion district, sold everything, and then I moved to England and I started doing stand-up there. And it was like 4 o'clock in the morning and I was waiting for a bus to get home and I went to this chip shop. We can all figure out what a chip shop is, right? It's a little restaurant. And I walked in and there was uh, uh, no menu on the wall. It was just a white room. And then after about a minute, this guy walks out from the, from the back and he's like, uh, yes. 
And I was like, uh, hi, can I get some uh, chicken and chips? He was like, uh, chicken and chips? And I was like, uh, yeah, chicken and chips. And he was like, uh, chicken and chips? And I was like, uh, what are we doing here? And he's like, oh, sorry, my dad just died and left me this chip shop. I have no idea what I'm doing. And I was like, well, you're never going to believe this, but your dad owes me $30,000. I miss him. I yeah. dream about him. I see him in my dreams. He's always like in the background of certain dreams. And then sometimes like we talk, but like there's certain times where I'm like at a party and there's lots of people at a party and he and he's always wearing the same thing, black pants, black button shirt, two buttons open. And it's always that, always. That. The first time I saw him in a dream, I had to go down like this Cave of Wonders style set staircase into no. an eight, I swear, into an 80s style living room where it was my dad, my grandmother, two or three other relatives that I recognized but didn't know very well. They're watching an 80s style television with like the big butt. My dad gets up off the couch, walks right over to me and says, what are you doing here? And then I wake up. It's like one of those weird moments where you're like, what was that? What was that room that I was just in? Is that like yeah. a holding pattern or am I imagining this? Is that where you went? Is that, what is that? So I wonder what that is. If it's just your subconscious, subconscious just like. I think it's some connection too to the other realm and, and energy. It has to do more than just yourself. There's definitely a connection. If it was just yourself, you'd be able to control it and you'd be able to see these people anytime you wanted to. Right, yeah. But I think at some point these dreams are based on certain things opening up. Certain, certain. let's not use the word realms, but realms. Like something right. that opens up that lets you connect with other people. And that's kind of what happens. There's a, uh, somebody just put up this phone booth in this, I think it's in somebody's yard even in, in Japan, um, where they had built it to talk to their dead relatives. Relatives. And now it's become like this international thing where people mm -hmm. travel you know, all over the world to come and use this phone. And it's, of course, it's not hooked up to anything or whatever, but they will go out there and they will pick it up and they will just speak to their loved ones who have passed on. And it's... How stupid is that, huh? Right. <laughs> dumb? You dummies, it's not even hooked up. You gotta go to Japan for this? Pick up your phone. You want me to give you a Nokia sidekick? You can do that on a sidekick. That shit doesn't work either. Hasn't been plugged in in 12 years. <laughs> Talk to your dead mom. <laughs> Talk to your dead mom. I got, I got an old Galaxy phone there. <laughs> Talk to your mom. <laughs> ah, you don't need to go to Japan. <laughs> go to Melrose. You can find a broken like a, phone. A new hustle. That you just, you're walking out. Hey, you want to talk to your hey, dead mom? Hey, <laughs> hey, oh, hey you want to talk to your grandma? <laughs> that was so funny. <laughs> Five dollars a minute. So stupid. Talk to your dead grandma. Tell you, what's your dead grandma's name? Victoria? Okay, we get her on the line. We'll get her on the line. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Victoria, your stupid grandson's here. <laughs> Four years, man. Four years. It's not that long. It's just one Summer Olympics when you really think about it. It's just one fucking Tokyo. That's all it's been. And uh, it doesn't get easy. It doesn't get... I, I thought it was going to get easier. The thing that really uh, bugs me is that there's not going to be any new photos of him. That's the one that kills me because we live in a fucking generation of post, post, post. I got no fucking dad to post about anymore, which kills me. So I just take pictures of... My dick. I don't know why I just said that. That's so stupid. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why I just said that. <laughs> I don't know. And you did something different than I did. Um, you uh, you had spent because uh, you and your mother are very close. Yeah. Right. And my mother and I were very close, but I didn't have. I have the hindsight now, but in those moments, I didn't realize how much it affected my mother you mm -hmm. know i was in caught up in my own selfish world and I, I you know i took i took 11 days off to be with my mother and then i went back on tour yeah and like left her there in ohio and you know would call to check in and of course when i would come around i would see her and stuff but you were going on trips with your mother you were spending time with her you were really like showing up well there's a difference though my mom had been divorced for 10 years since I mean, before my dad passed. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, my parents got divorced in 2007. Okay. So my mom was like, not relieved, but she could tell true stories about my dad now without it being hurtful because he was alive. She right. told me some stuff. She told me some stuff that was wrong and, you, you know, old timey and 
yeah. very different culturally and not acceptable. And so to her, she was like, no, I fucking made it. I'm the strong one in this situation. And I respected her for that too. She's still my mom. Yeah. She was in a relationship with this guy and, and to her, it was something that had finished and she was definitely sad, but her life was uh, more important to her which is completely understandable. Yeah, I think a lot of times we don't see our parents on this human level because they're no. our parents. Yeah, and capes, freak, always they got capes. Always capes, and you think that they're above any kind no. of feelings or heartache or anything, and you're like, no. If anything, it's multiplied. Yes. Because they have children. Yeah. We don't have kids. Right. I don't have kids. Yeah. Um, yeah, my mother, um, you know, my, my real father was on everything but the right path. And, uh, but my mother always kept that side of his life secret. Yeah. You know, cause she wanted me to always view him as my father. Right. She didn't want to take that away from him. So, but when, um, you know, he passed when I was 12. And so growing up, I would get little stories here and there leaked out usually by accident. You know, she's, she'd make a comment or something. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And she's like, oh, well, you know, then she'd have to like, tell me the rest. And it sounds like you have a little, a few missing puzzle pieces. Like I, I did cause my, you know, he passed away and I was really young. And then my mother fell in love again and had all this other, you know, I got to see that. Mm -hmm. I got to see the magic of my mother following in, in love yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and finding this person and all that stuff. Um, but you, you have this these missing puzzle pieces because your parents were divorced. And so I, I love that, that you're you're now getting a, a little glimpse in that. And oh, you're, yeah. You're able to piece together. Because, again, this mystery of who are our parents really. Yeah. You didn't, didn't ask you enough questions. Yeah, definitely yeah. did not. I mean, there's families that do ask a lot of questions and they sit down at dinner and they right. discuss what's going on. But we took time for granted when growing up, like we took time super for granted, like just pick up some food in the kitchen and go back to your room and watch TV. It was like that kind of situation where there was no bonding. There was like, just we're a family, we're a unit. That's good enough. Like we're just happy being under this roof together, but we're not growing as much as we should be growing. We're not communicating a lot. Right. So there was that issue as well. I think my dad was just like a workaholic. He absolutely wanted to be at work all the time he loved hustling he loved making money and my mom was my mom is just a person who people are attracted to people just flock to her and she just always has like a community around her because of how loving she is like she can become friends with literally anybody like when we go out shopping she will become friends <laughs> with the person who's getting her the shoes so she can try them on right like they'll trade numbers by the end of the night I'm like mom why are you trading numbers with the person from the walking store like, i yeah. don't know she was nice like it's just who she is it's just wild relationships are just crazy yeah and you know especially when when you become older and become more of an adult and you start to see the world and in, in other ways and you you do you see that other side of your parents and that begins this whole new relationship with them and that's the relationship i had with my my mother later in later in life because we were you know good friends for the majority of my life but we were like real fucking good friends the older i got we're close i mean i, I find it hard sometimes to relate but we're close i don't know it's just, maybe i'm just not i just know i'm not her favorite that's kind of what it is. It's just like, <laughs> it's hard to talk to my mom when I know I'm second. Right. You know? Right. You know? Does that make sense? I've never said these words out loud, but right. I feel like it's the, I feel like it's the true reason why I'm always like, mom, like, what's going on with us? Like, it's like, right. it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm second. I'm second. It makes you, sense. Oh, you feel that way? Yeah, yeah. My sister is married, has a kid. Oh, well, yeah. You're I am single <laughs> comedian. No way. How could I, I have to be second. The joke used to be, it's like, my sister's one, our dog Frosty, miniature Maltese was two, three and four are empty just in case she doesn't want to offend anybody yeah. and then I'll be five. <laughs> Before we, we took him to the cremation place, crematorium, I guess would be the phrase I'm looking for, which sounds like an ice cream shop, but it's not. <laughs> Trust me, don't get ice cream from the crematorium. <laughs> Hi, Joy. Hey. I know Joy. I recognized her laugh, even with the mask. She's a Joy. Um, can we cut that out? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so my family, my Indian side of the family. This is a quick thing I think you guys should know. They, we had to put him up on this like wooden plank to get him from the house to the crematorium. 
uh, you just look like a backup singer for My Chemical Romance. So that's why I just keep fucking looking at you like, this guy knows about death. And, uh, and so we, we get him up on this wooden plank and then he's tied down to it. And that was the first time I knew he had, was dead because they put like a, like a, they tied him and I was like, don't do that. And then I was like, oh wait, no, he's gone. And uh, we picked him up and then we go outside. I trust me, it's getting funny. Uh, just it's coming around the corner. Uh, we go outside and there's a Toyota Highlander. And they're like, put him in the Highlander. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, they open the trunk. And then they, they start to put him in the car. And then they're like, oh my God, the car's not big enough for the body. Omi, get in the back of this Toyota Highlander and hold your dad in while we drive through India. And I was like, what? Like, yeah, yeah, we can't close the door. You just got to sit in the back, hold him in. And if he falls out, it's not the worst thing that could happen to him. So I was like, because he's dead. And um, so there I was in the back of a Toyota Highlander holding him. He made it. Don't worry. I held on tight, knowing it was the last time. Time will never, ever stop and give you a break. It will continue because it has to. Otherwise, you'll live in the moment of grief. Time is kind of a blessing. Time is sort of the blessing that keeps you going because it doesn't stop. Because if time stopped for everybody's grief, oh, it'd be like year two. <laughs> it, it, we would make yeah. it to right now because everybody always grieves. So that's kind of what like I found out is that like your time is you know, circular, like it's going to keep going around and around. And yeah, you just, it's never going to stop. No matter how bad it is, no matter how good it is, it's never going to stop. That's the probably the biggest, easiest thing I realized. 